in this regard. And my question is to ask the Minister if he would stress the urgency at both European Union and United Nations levels in realising a political solution to the Syrian crisis and also to ensure that commitments made on the humanitarian aid are realised. Thank you, Lester Corla. Ireland continues to support the efforts by the European Union and the United Nations to promote a political resolution to the current conflict in both Syria and Iraq. We have repeatedly stressed that only a political solution can achieve a sustainable peace in Syria. We will also continue to address the humanitarian consequences of the conflict and provide urgent assistance and support to the civilian populations within Syria and Iraq who have been displaced or suffered violations of their rights at the hands of ISIS and other extremists. Ireland is working to support the efforts led by the UN Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura to promote a political resolution based on, on the Geneva Principles and which provide for transition to an agreed democratic form of government and the holding of genuinely free national elections in Syria. Mr. de Mistura discussed measures to address the acute security and humanitarian situation, as well as possible steps to move towards a political process with foreign ministers in Brussels for, uh, for a meeting uh, of the December 2014 Foreign Affairs Council. The EU is the main donor towards humanitarian relief in Syria, providing a total of three billion since the outset of the conflict. Ireland has already provided almost, 20, almost 29 million euro in humanitarian support to Syria since 2011, delivered through the United Nations partners and non-governmental organizations. I've already recently approved a further 1.8 million in funding to UNICEF and UNHCR to support the refugee situation and child victims of the conflict. In addition, we have provided a sum of 1.15 million euro in funding our partner organizations responding to the crisis in neighboring Iraq. Ireland has consistently advocated for safe and unimpeded humanitarian access, as well as for the respect by all parties of international humanitarian law. Last week, during my visit to the Middle East region, I had the opportunity to meet in Beirut with Ireland's honorary consul in Syria, and he briefed me on the ongoing developments there. Maureen Sullivan. Thank you. I think the, the, the key word is urgency, and there's no doubt that one crisis is, will overtake another crisis. We saw that, I think, Gaza was overtaken by Syria, Syria now being overtaken by the crisis in Ukraine, and I've absolutely no doubt that the next one is going to be Libya. Um, I had the opportunity with the Foreign Affairs Committee at the invitation of Goal to visit the Turkish-Syrian border recently and we saw the extent of the humanitarian aid and I suppose I want to acknowledge the Syrian employees of the NGOs who are working inside Syria. Um, one of the points I'd like to make is that we understand that 46% of the aid that has been pledged um, in the humanitarian area, only 46% has been realised. And some of the biggest culprits on this are the Gulf states. And I do think that there should be a stronger effort to ensure that all the humanitarian aid that has been promised does go in. There is a particular issue over the use of barrel bombs, and I do think that this is an issue that has to be addressed at the UN and at EU level. And the other point I would make there is a strong condemnation of the war crimes by all parties in the conflict, Thank war you. crimes that include rape and violence and the use of children as soldiers. Thank you. Minister? Yeah, I'm, I wish to thank Deputy O'Sullivan for her continued engagement in this matter and for raising the, 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 um, the issues um, regularly here in the House and beyond. Um, and she's right. Um, one of the most difficult features of the crisis in Syria uh, is that many of those who are most in need uh, are beyond the reach of humanitarian aid. And uh, many are unable to receive it, and many are only receiving it on a sporadic basis. But the Syrian government and rebel factions are using, are using siege tactics and heavy weaponry in populated areas. The operating environment is extremely volatile, indeed insecure, particularly in areas controlled by the opposition. Uh, and I believe it's important uh, that, that, that we continue uh, to welcome the adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 2165 last July, which authorised the delivery of humanitarian aid by the United Nations and its partners across the border into Syria, uh, even, without, even without the consent 
of the Assad regime. The United Nations has been delivering cross-border aid where local conditions make this feasible. Thank you, Mr. Ireland, Ireland continues to work through a variety of channels, including our established United Nations partners, NGO partners, Red Cross, Red Crescent in Syria, Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan to ensure that our Irish aid can be delivered across the borders and conflict lines Thank into those uh, who most need it. Deputy Sullivan. Yeah. Where IS is controlling borders, they either won't allow humanitarian aid in or they will take half of it themselves or they will look for some monetary contribution. So that's just perpetuating what's going on. There is an issue with the Lebanese government of issuing registration of, N of NGOs, particularly the, in the international NGOs, and they're the ones who have the vast experience that they can train the, the other NGOs from the country, so it's vital that they get in, and perhaps that's something that you could address. There's also another point about refugees. There's no doubt you've seen it yourself, the extent of the, the pressure on countries like Turkey and Lebanon, where Turkey can absorb it somewhat because of its size, Lebanon can't. But there is a figure that Turkey has received 10 times the number of Syrian refugees uh, as compared with all EU member states together. And I do think that the EU member states could be doing more on um, the refugee situation. And finally, we are a main player when it comes to humanitarian aid. That's completely recognised. But we constantly hear that Ireland is another type of force, a political force, and sometimes I don't think we realise that the extent of the importance of our voice at both EU level and at um, you, you, UN level. Again, I, 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 uh, I wish to stress the, the um, importance of ensuring uh, an adequate level of humanitarian aid uh, to the region. Uh, I acknowledge what the Deputy has said with particular reference to refugees in Lebanon uh, and indeed in Jordan uh, and in, 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 uh, in the wider region. Um, in December, the United Nations released uh, its 2015 Syria a Syria crisis appeal plan uh, requesting over $8.4 billion to meet the needs of millions of people in Syria and across the region. So far this year, I have approved funding of 1.8 million euro to alleviate suffering in Syria and neighbouring countries. But I acknowledge, as the Deputy says, that we need to do more. In this regard, a donor pledging a conference will take place in Kuwait at the end of March. I'm pleased to announce Minister Sean Sherlock will attend. He will have an opportunity uh, on behalf of the Irish government uh, to set out how we intend to target our assistance to Syria and the region this Thank year. You, Ireland will also make a pledge in relation to how much funding we can commit to the Syria crisis in 2015. We are currently considering how Ireland can best respond to the needs there while remaining mindful of the huge needs of people affected by other humanitarian crises across the world uh, in Africa and elsewhere. Thank you. The next Thank question. you. It's to ask the Minister if he will set a date to meet the Justice for the Forgotten Group and the Pat Finucane Centre in relation to the issues surrounding them in the Stormont House Agreement and the outstanding issues relating to the bombings. Thank you, Minister. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has a long-standing working relationship with the Justice for the, for, with the, Justice for, for the Forgotten Group. Uh, it's also in regular and ongoing contact with the Pat Finucane Centre on a range of legacy-related issues. My officials are in contact with the Justice for the Forgotten Group with a view towards arranging a meeting to discuss the Stormont House Agreement. The government continues to support the Justice for the Forgotten Group in their campaign on behalf of the Dublin and Monaghan families. In this regard, the group has received grant support of €48,000 in early 2014 from my department's Reconciliation Fund. The funding will assist the Justice for the Forgotten Group with its work of great importance. Justice for the Forgotten operates as a project of the Pat Finucane Centre, which itself received a further grant of €50,000 in the most recent round of Reconciliation Fund grants late last year. Overall, between 2002 and 2014, the Pat Finucane Centre and the Justice for the Forgotten Group have received funding to the order of €348,500 from the Reconciliation Fund. The focus of the government is currently on the effective and expeditious implementation of the Stormont House Agreement. In this context, I participated in the first implementation and review meeting of the agreement in Belfast on the 30th of January last, at which a detailed implementation timeline was agreed. Work on the implementation is progressing well, and a second review meeting will take place next month. A progress report will be published 
in June 2015, and the Government remains committed to playing its full part in ensuring the full and detailed implementation of the agreement. Thank you, Minister. Deputy Maureen so, Silva. Um, do I take it from that, Minister, that you will meet the Justice for the Forgotten Group? And just regarding the funding to them last year, they were in actual fear last year that that funding was going to be stopped and there had to be pressure um, and uh, meetings with the Minister, your predecessor, on that particular point. Last May was the 40th anniversary and the Taoiseach himself came to the commemoration on Talbot Street. So 40 years, the relatives and the survivors are waiting on answers. And again, I go back to the word I used before, urgency. I mean, how much longer do they have to wait? And certainly when I met Secretary of State Villiers, I didn't get the slightest impression that this was top of her agenda, that she would be supporting the releasing all, all that information to an international commission. Um, when you read the accounts of the, from the families, and particularly from the survivors, one of whom was a 14-year-old boy at the stage, just after starting his, his job, he woke up in the morgue because they thought he was dead. And he still lives with the nightmares from that particular time. So he's living with the psychological scars of that time. And I just, I think President Michael D. Higgins put it very succinctly when he said, a strategy of amnesia is simply not an option. So I do think 40 years, we're moving into the 41st anniversary, it's time that that Commission of Inquiry has access to all of the documents. Thank you, Minister. Could I say to the Deputy that the Government fully supports the all-party Dáil motions of July 2008, May 2011, urging the British Government to allow access by an independent international judicial figure to all documents in their possession relating to the Dublin Monaghan bombings. I have raised this issue on several occasions with Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Theresa Villiers, including most recently when I had the opportunity of meeting her in Dublin uh, on the 11th of this month. She has assured me that she would consider afresh how the British Government can respond to the Dáil motions. I welcome the continued all-party support for the campaign on behalf of the Dublin Monaghan families. As I noted earlier, the Justice for the Forgotten campaign, which supports victims and their families uh, and operates as a project of the Pat Finucane Centre, continues to receive grant aid from my department. Uh, as noted in my reply, the Government continues to have a long-standing relationship with both the Justice for the Forgotten and the Pat Finucane Centre, and meetings have taken place on several occasions, including at the most recent senior political level. Contact at official level is regular, is ongoing. In recent weeks, my officials in Belfast have met with representatives of both organisations, and following these discussions at official level, I remain open to considering a meeting with Thank both you. groups. Deputy Sullivan. Um, I mean, the point is, Minister, that the Justice for the Forgotten Group would really welcome a meeting with you personally as the new Minister for Foreign Affairs. Um, the Department of Justice, through the Victims of Crime Office, has committed to providing funding for the physical needs of those injured in the trouble-related attacks, and that is very much to be welcomed and is very needed. But there's no funding available for those, like the man whom I mentioned there, suffering psychological injuries. And I would ask that you might discuss this with the Minister for Justice to ensure that the psychological harm that was done to the survivors and that, that, that there is funding for those who need that counselling. And I mean, okay, you could say it's 40 years ago, but each year and the anniversary, each time there's another bombing or another incident like that, all of those scars are reopened and there is a need for continuous counselling at those particular times. So the Minister, the Secretary of State saying she will consider, I mean, I just don't think that's good enough 40 years later. Thank you. Minister, to conclude. While both groups have acknowledged by the Deputy have received a, a significant amount of financial support uh, to acknowledge uh, the important work that they do, in, including around dealing with the legacy of the past. Between 2003 and 2008, Justice for the Forgotten received just over 1.2 million euro from the Remembrance Commission through the Department of Justice for counselling and other support services for the victims of the troubles. This commission was wound up in 2008, but a further allocation of 190,000 was provided by the Department of Justice to allow the group to transition to other funding arrangements. The Pat Finucane Centre received 98,000 euro from my department's reconciliation fund in 2014, uh, including some of 48,000 for a, a project organised by the Justice for the Forgotten Group. So overall, between 2002 and 2014, the Pat Finucane Centre and Justice for the Forgotten have received funding to the order of €350,000 from the Reconciliation and Sectarianism Fund. But I will continue to monitor the situation uh, in the light uh, of what the Deputy